Well, having um, done some of the uh, plays that Beckett had written uh, at San Quentin as an inmate, we had our actual uh, workshop for two years. We're involved with nothing but a circle of his plays, uh, Waiting for Godot, Endgame, and Crap's Last Tape. And in that two-year period, we gave seven different productions of those three plays. Um, and back in the early 60s, um, there was as much confusion about what uh, Waiting for Godot was all about as there is perhaps even today. Well, when we staged his plays, uh, Waiting for Godot was the first play we staged at the prison, and that would have been in 1961. And um, obviously we were stumbling around, and the, the kind of a funny story that comes out of this is um, we were, we had staged it on a boxing ring in an abandoned chapel at the prison at San Quentin. And oddly enough, where we placed the boxing ring was right under the trap door where they formerly used to hang uh, the condemned prisoners um, back in the 30s. And um, we had assembled an audience there from the San Francisco Actors Workshop. Um, and they were a bit nervous, as we were. And then when we began to play, it was oh so circular. God, it was very circular. Act one is almost like act two, except for the physical uh, moments in it. Well, we ended up doing act one almost twice, because it was a transposition in the language. We had taken the script from the theater arts magazine of that day, where it was published. But the binding had been done incorrectly, so that the acts were mixed up and he took the actor's workshop to tell us, well, why did you do act one twice? <laughs> well, who knew? <laughs> well, I've, I met Beckett in 1975, well, actually late 1974 in Paris, where I had brought a production of uh, his play Endgame uh, to the American Cultural Center in Paris, and Beckett uh, I didn't attend this performance, but he met with me the next day, and um, as it turned out, I had an opportunity to go to Berlin and direct a play with the German company, and as luck would have it, Beckett was also going to Berlin to direct a German uh, production of Waiting for Godot, which is his most famous work. And so, just like that, we were both in Berlin together, and uh, I was invited to watch him direct Waiting for Godot at the Schiller Theater. I spent 10 weeks with the master, and um, I didn't really have to do much, um, but it was something, there was something incredible about watching how he staged his own work on, um, on, with German actors, French actors, American actors. The man just had a, a very strong understanding of what it was he wanted on the stage. Well, naturally, the plays he had already written some he did transform from, uh, transpose from the French language to English, and then others he went from English to the French language. So he was translating his own work back and forth. Um, the choreography, the way, the shape of his work on the stage in, let's say, other people's hands um, appeared a little heavy, a little um, off the center of it. Uh, but with Sam, he knew exactly the movement, the um, corporeal punctuation that uh, actors sometimes avoid when they're acting. But he wanted that inner voice, and he, you always found a great, with Beckett, you got a great deal of music, a musicality, a rhythm, a rhyming notion from the language. I mean, the poetry of the language itself is um, spellbinding. But the themes, of course, of uh, that's something else. When they asked him, well, what if, who is Gado? What does Gado mean? Um, Beck was always fond of saying, well, if I knew, I would have said so in the play. And when he would direct me, particularly, he was very sensitive to what an actor feels. But if you were doing it wrong, he would say, it's all wrong. And of course, you'd start over again. I found him a saintly man. Uh, was very, very kind to us, and um, he, I think, has a reputation of being severe and nihilistic, um, godless man. That's quite not the case at all. Um. 
I'm sorry, in Stuttgart. And at Stuttgart, Sam was directing some of his smaller plays. Uh, plays and uh, this Italian photographer showed him the number of photographs he had taken of Beckett. And Beckett looked at me and he said, would you like to have one of these? And he autographed that one to me. Um, said, Rick, uh, lots of love, Sam. He wanted the spoken voice without any color, just almost tone up. Uh, the poetry of the language says everything. You don't you don't bring too much to that to the to the world of his language. You simply articulate it, and there is a rhythmic structure. There's a music to that language. After work, if you will, we'd all enjoy a, a little Bushmills or or Jameson's Irish, or if there was some scotch around, some scotch too. And um, having a meal with him or um, a coffee. Uh, often during the breaks on stage we would do that. And one found him to be quietly but intensely interested in the person who he was speaking to or the person who had the floor at that moment. In the case of a bunch of actors sitting around a cafe table, there was some jokes. There was, there was, he had a wonderful sense of humor. I would say San Quentin and the play um, made an inten um, indelible mark on me personally. The, not only the prison, but Beckett's play, Waiting for Gatto. And it was so much about my life, I felt, especially when uh, Lucky and Pazzo come in. And Lucky, of course, has the rope around his neck. Well, that imagery alone in a performance at a prison would indicate, well, who's, got, who's holding the rope? The warden? <laughs> and that was exactly the way Pazzo comes across, as this, you know, um, controlling man and uh, he has a slave at the end of the rope. And by extension, I suppose, the two tramps were all humanity. But in the case of a performance at a prison, one would say they were in prison too. I was released from San Quentin. I had a life without possibility of parole. That was what I was sentenced to. But I received the governor's pardon and uh, was allowed out on parole around December of 1966. And I had served a total of 11 years, nine months, um, and 14 days. And then I t came out to a life uh, parole situation. And right away, we began to go into institutions with a play I had written called The Cage. And um, one could see the impact that a theater performance at a prison had upon the inmates. And it was. In my own case, after all those years in prison, performing for other prisoners, the plays of Samuel Beckett and other writers, that there's a wonderful psychology involved with a text, a written text, a play, if you will. A transformation occurs, I've noticed with other inmates and um, in my own person, personal life that you learn to talk, to, to communicate better. You learn, for example, um, how to walk properly. You know um, by reading a script that, or by suffering your own inadequacies, if, if, you are tr if you can't read, then you have to learn to read. Then you have to learn to talk and to walk and to find some social grace in a play. And it, it allows a person to step outside of themselves and become someone else. And I've felt in the plays that I've performed at the prison that that was very good therapy for me personally. And my observations of other members um, of our theater company at San Quentin, we did, after all, um, 35 plays in a total of about nine, eight, eight years and a few months. So it was a wonderful experience and, and it offered hope. I, I saw hope in people who had no hope. I saw a change in personality for people who, who were unable to communicate with other people. And once you allow yourself the um, therapy of performing someone else, it allows you personally to become the other person. 
And that is therapeutic. 